Well, and that actually might be as good a note as any to, to get started. Um, of course, uh, I think a lot of us are being impacted um, by COVID-19 and the coronavirus, and many of us are learning how to use things like Zoom for the first time. In fact, the GACC actually just downloaded it, and we're uh, very excited to be able to bring this webinar um, to all of our members. Um, my name uh, is William Reed. I am the Executive Director of the German American Chamber of Commerce Colorado chapter. Um, and as I was mentioning, uh, we are obviously in unprecedented times right now where we are all experiencing this together as a whole um, across the globe. Um, and it's impacting us in very different ways um, from our personal lives to our business lives. Uh, and we're very excited to be able to bring this webinar to you um, along with World Denver. Um, and uh, we're very excited that so many of you are able to join us. Um, again, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, please keep your audio on mute um, for the remainder of the webinar. Uh, if you do have questions, we absolutely welcome them for our speakers. Um, and if you could please enter your questions in the chat bar, uh, which is available um, on the lower part of Zoom for uh, most, most people. Um, I would like to introduce to you um, our moderator for the webinar, uh, Paul Maracle. Paul is a member of the German American Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, uh, and he also serves as the honorary consul uh, for, of Germany uh, in the districts of Colorado and Wyoming. Um, so uh, Paul will be moderating today's session and he'll be introducing today's speakers. So take it away, Paul. Thanks everybody. It's really exciting to see we've got a hundred people signed up for this. Um, first of all, I wanna just uh, thank the German American Chamber of Commerce Colorado staff, uh, Executive Director William Reed, who's uh, just been talking to you, Event Manager Mary Wallace, Membership Communications Manager Iris Belinsky. They're all working from home they're really getting a lot of stuff done, even though they're working at home. If I were working at home, I'd be do laundry and watching TV. So uh, I uh, appreciate their dedication to, uh, to getting the job done and, uh, and for getting this uh, first ever uh, webinar uh, together for our group. Um, I'm Honorary Consul for Germany here in Colorado and Wyoming, and I just thought I would mention a couple of things to our membership who are German citizens. We're getting a lot of calls, people inquiring about travel uh, to Germany. Um, basically, bottom line is, uh, if you're a German citizen, you can fly back to Germany if you can get an airline seat. Uh, Germany has closed its borders, but not to German citizens. Uh, uh, all other travel, I think, is being discouraged uh, for the next 30 days. So if you've got a ticket, fine. Uh, stay in contact with your airline and uh, don't be frustrated if you have a hard time getting through. That's everybody's problem right now and the consulate can't help you with that. So um, that said, let's move on to our guest speakers. We're really fortunate today to have two uh, great uh, professionals to speak to us. Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Bo Su Kim. He's assistant professor of medicine at John Hopkins Hospital. Uh, his areas of uh, expertise include pulmonary disease and critical care, which of course is uh, one of the primary uh, concerns about the COVID-19 virus. Uh, and our second speaker will be Professor Sandy Johnson director and uh, teaching professor of global health affairs uh, at, at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at DU here in Denver. So um, thank you very much for making yourselves available. And Dr. Uh, Kim, maybe you would start off. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to connect with so many people. Uh, let's get started. I, I was given a set of questions really kind of to focus our discussion today. So uh, one of the first questions was, next time we have a pandemic, will we, better, will we be better prepared uh, in the world? And I think the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Uh, I think with each 
in every health crisis, we learn a lot and we uh, prepare better for the next one. I think, uh, you know, the first ICU was developed because of a polio in, uh, epidemic in the 1950s. Uh, you know, going back to, uh, going fast forwarding to modern times, we learned a lot from the 2009 H1N1 uh, epidemic on how to care for refractory respiratory failure uh, and severe uh, lung disease. You know, this, this question also highlights our differences on how the U.S. has handled uh, this pandemic versus other countries. Uh, I think cr countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan has learned a, a great deal from the SARS epidemic in 2003, and they really had a lot of infrastructure in place to adequately screen the population and really limit its spread. Uh, and South Korea also learned a great deal from uh, their outbreak in 2015 of MERS, which is a Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, another coronavirus uh, that had killed 36 and infected uh, close to 200 people. Uh, they have an infrastructure in place where they can track down uh, exposures through cell phone and credit card uh, use. And so those are, uh, infrastructure and resources that we do not have in our country at the moment. Uh, you know, our response to this COVID-19 pandemic was rather sluggish in the beginning. Uh, CDC was really limiting the number of tests that were performed on patients, even if you were symptomatic. Uh, originally, they, had, they were only testing uh, patients who had known exposures to sick contacts or known exposures to actual COVID-19 cases. And so even though, uh, you know, by February, this, this disease was well beyond containment, you know, we were seeing cases uh, reach the western shores of our country, we, we did not have the adequate uh, resources or the testing kits available to us to test, uh, you know, people. And we're really only beginning to ramp up our testing. Uh, you know, in the beginning, back in early, uh, early March, our testing was way behind uh, other countries like Italy and South Korea. Uh, five tests per million population uh, versus 3,000 in South Korea. So uh, now we've gone up to about 74. So we're really starting to catch on, but I think uh, uh, our original response was, was inadequate. You know, lessons can be learned from how Italy, uh, the, the crisis that's occurring in Italy, you know, their first case was back in January 31st. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, um, the first cluster of pneumonia cases that occurred in China in the Wuhan region uh, back in December 31st. And the, <clears throat> this new novel coronavirus was detected uh, in January 9th. The first confirmed case in the U.S. was January 20th. Uh, from a Chinese individual who had come back from the Wuhan province. And in Italy, the first case was in January 31st. And they really did uh, do what they could at that time. They suspended all flights to and from China on January 31st and declared a state of emergency. Unfortunately, they did not have the same infrastructure to test all exposed individuals and track uh, potential exposure throughout its community, throughout the uh, throughout its citizens, and it wasn't until February 6th where uh, an Italian had tested positive in the in Lombardy region, uh, where it, would be, it became apparent that uh, new clusters were being detected throughout uh, northern Italy. And they had declared a state of, uh, state of emergency very early on, and they went to full quarantine of the Lombardy region on February 22nd. Uh, the, and then by March 9th, they were on complete lockdown. The problem with Italy was they don't have the same healthcare infrastructure as some of the other countries, and certainly not like our country, and also their population is uh, really the second oldest uh, population for a country, uh, second in the world, uh, Japan is first. And so their outbreak, although originally identified early on and uh, attempts were made to contain it early on really uh, failed, and uh, and their numbers are really 
Unfortunately, they, they're seeing mortality of 7% and, um, you know, 10% of uh, healthcare workers, 10% of positive ca cases are amongst the healthcare workers taking care of patients. Now, contrast that with our country. We uh, just started seeing cases back in January, and originally the CDC said no one gets tested unless there is um, sick exposure, but it wasn't until February 29th when they had opened it up to all severe respiratory cases can be tested um, regardless of exposure history. And so even at that point, we didn't have the adequate number of cases, number of kits to test our population. And so uh, this was a long-winded answer to will we be better prepared next time? Uh, I, think, uh, I think our response will be quicker. Uh, many countries will have more infrastructure and more resources in place, and we will be better able to handle a pandemic like this. I think our experience with the original SARS back in 2003, uh, we had very few cases here and it really never reached our shores to any great extent. And I think it certainly created maybe a false sense of security, some complacency, and really kind of delayed our response uh, to this epidemic now. Uh, moving on to uh, what myths are out there and what, um, what, are, what are the, uh, the facts about, um, about COVID-19. So the first thing uh, I would like to address is that surgical masks, N95 masks, they should not be worn by the general public, uh, and especially if you are healthy. Now there is a role of surgical masks if you are sick and having symptoms that you can limit the spread of droplets by wearing a surgical mask. But if you are healthy, first of all, the N95 mask uh, needs to be fitted uh, it comes in different sizes, and so if it's not properly fitted, it's not going to be effective. And uh, really, the main mode of contact is by people touching surfaces and then uh, touching their face uh, and transmitting the virus that way. And so it's very rare for you to encounter someone who's going to cough in your face or, or sneeze uh, without covering their mouth. And so uh, it's really more a transmission through contact. And uh, you know, so really brings to the point that uh, hand washing uh, is really, and, and isolating yourself is really, really the modes of protection that you need. Uh, same thing goes for gloves. Uh, you know, if you're going to uh, wear gloves 24 hours a day, it may be protective, but I, I've seen many people wearing gloves and still touching their face. And so that contact transmission uh, risk does not uh, get mitigated. Um, the next myth I would say is really what are some of the treatments out there? Uh, you know, flu shots, Tamiflu, vitamin C, uh, they are all pretty much ineffective for coronavirus. Now, vitamin C, there's no harm in taking some moderate doses of vitamin C, and I think most people think that it will boost their immune system, and so we don't discourage people from doing that, but uh, there's no proven efficacy of vitamin C against coronavirus. And certainly, any of the online remedies that you hear about, uh, you know, sometimes the, the Indian teas or made of cow urine and things like that are not effective at all. And there's no proven efficacy of homeopathic medications. Now, as far as the effective treatments, right now, first and foremost is all supportive care. You know, a third of the cases that we see are mild uh, cases, no to mild to minimal symptoms. Uh, another third, are more severe, need hospitalization, but are not critically ill. And then about a third of the cases, they do reach a level of critical illness, meaning that they need uh, intubation and be, being placed on a mechanical ventilator, being placed in an ICU. Uh, and these are the patients that really uh, are at, at risk for mortality and really uh, use up a lot of the healthcare resources. Now, what's effective for uh, patients with coronavirus. So there is a medication called remdesivir. This is a medication, an antiviral drug that was first developed for the Ebola epidemic uh, back in 2014. And it has been shown to have some uh, effects, uh, some efficacy against coronavirus. 
And so there are a lot of um, uh, clinical trials being started with this remdesivir. And so uh, any institution can apply to be part of these clinical trials. You can also apply uh, for compassionate use. So if you have a patient that is uh, really doing poorly and is severely ill, uh, you can apply to use this medication off-label uh, before it's been approved uh, to try to help uh, the patients uh, with severe disease. Now, there are institutions that are, are starting uh, to implement guidelines to use hydroxychloroquine, which is an anti-malarial drug and also some antiviral medications, uh, anti-HIV meds that have been shown to be have some activity against coronavirus uh, in Australia. And so for severely ill patients, the ones that are in the ICUs, uh, we're seeing a lot more use of, uh, of these new agents. And again, uh, it's not been proven by any clinical trials to uh, be life-saving or to really be effective against coronavirus, but there is some anecdotal evidence, some case-by-case -case, uh, evidence that uh, it may be helpful. And so we are starting to use these medications. Now, as far as vaccines are concerned, um, you know, you may have heard in the news that a new vaccine was being tested on humans even as of this week. And the um, truth is that we're still months away from uh, efficacy testing. This is just safety testing right now, phase one of, of clinical trial testing. And this new virus that you heard of uh, this past week is a, a new technology there. It's not actual viral proteins that they're using for the vaccine. It's actually RNA material, and, and really no previous vaccines have been based on this technology. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of barriers to getting this vaccine uh, to a stage where we can use it on patients. Uh, I think the best guess is, uh, you know, our first vaccines will maybe be available uh, in, in a year, 2021. So uh, the next myth that I would like to address is that uh, this is really <clears throat> a disease of the elderly. Um, yes, that most of the patients who are dying from this disease are older. If you look at all mortalities, 58% uh, are over 80 years old and another 31% are over 70 years old. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean that the younger patients or younger population is protected. Uh, now, you know, a third of these patients, even the younger patients, will become sick, will need hospital care, and will become a, a tremendous burden to the healthcare system. And I think, uh, you know, when you see reports of young people out there partying, uh, you know, they really need to know that, uh, yes, they can not only become sick with this disease, but also they can be uh, asymptomatic uh, transmitters of the disease to family members and friends and anyone that they contact. Uh, now, we, we have, I was just taking care of a patient that was 40 years old in the ICU uh, who was critically ill and real, with no comorbidities. And even if you hear about comorbidities, which are other health issues, other uh, chronic illnesses, uh, you know, they're very common uh, comorbidities that we're talking about in the population, health disease, uh, heart disease, diabetes, uh, emphysema or COPD, uh, hypertension. So any of these uh, comorbidities can affect uh, the severity of illness and potentially uh, whether you can survive on this, uh, with this illness. Now, as far as uh, the survival of this virus on surfaces uh, or in the air. Uh, aerosolized virus can survive, you know, up to uh, six hours or more, um, but its potency uh, is reduced uh, significantly hour by hour. This, this also uh, is true for surfaces. Now, you may have heard reports that the virus can survive on cardboard for a day, uh, on plastic for four days, on stainless steel for three days. And these have been um, reported uh, by laboratory testing. But the transmissibility, uh, even though it's detected on these surfaces, <clears throat> is a bit unclear. And there is no evidence that uh, a package uh, that's been contaminated has transmitted this disease. Now, 
granted, we don't really know because we don't test every person every, uh, and we and many of the cases are community acquired, meaning that there's no exposure history. Uh, but there's nothing that's been documented that suggests that you can get this disease from public toilet seats, from uh, packages or food. But I would just, you know, exercise an extra degree of caution uh, when you order takeout or uh, when you go to a public restroom, where really be mindful of not touching your face and and washing your hands thoroughly and using Purell when it's available. Uh, and lastly, do dogs and cats transmit this disease? Again, very, very little evidence that dogs can uh, be contracted. Now, there was a case in China that a dog tested positive for coronavirus, but uh, again, there was no evidence that it can actually transmit to people. And so there's no reason to isolate dogs or cats. Um, there was a question uh, asking whether it was safe to go outside or go for a run. I think uh, when all the gyms are closed and, and you're going a little bit stir crazy, uh, exercising at home certainly is safe. And going out for a walk and going for a run should be also uh, acceptable. Uh, of course, you just have to be mindful of maintaining distance from other people and avoiding <clears throat> areas that are really crowded, like by the waterways or, or piers um, or certain parks. I think uh, you still have to maintain uh, safe distance and be mindful that there could be uh, sick people, uh, sick individuals uh, around the community. Um, I think uh, one of the last things that I'll uh, I'll mention, you know, I was asked how how can uh, everyday individuals help local businesses? Uh, what could you do with uh, your spare time? I think to help local businesses, you can certainly buy a gift card. Uh, order delivery when available, shop online when you can, <clears throat> and of course, uh, really be generous with your tips since uh, everyone is uh, economically uh, suffering and, um, and in financial distress. Uh, you can also leave reviews on Google or Yelp that could help businesses. And if they're in a service industry, you can certainly schedule appointments for something later on down the road and maybe um, all this quarantine has ended. Now, as far as volunteer activity, I think um, certain, certain uh, organizations like Meals on Wheels can always use help. Uh, you can always donate blood, uh, contact your nearest Red Cross. Uh, you know, in crises like this, when people are staying home, um, there still will be blood shortages and even more so um, because of the uh, reduced number of uh, volunteer donors. And also, uh, you can certainly provide help at homeless shelters and dog um, animal shelters really need help in fostering animals. Some of them may need to be forced to shut down and euthanize more animals. So uh, again, uh, if you're able to adopt a dog or cat, please do so. Um, I think uh, I'll end there and I'll be open to questions a little bit later on. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kim. Um, again, if you have questions, you there's the uh, chat bar at the bottom of the of your screen. You can uh, log in there or click on that and put in your question. And we'll get back to it. You'll be sticking around, right, Dr. Kim? Yes, yes, I will. Okay, so now let's move on to Professor Johnson. Take it away. All right, um, and again, many thanks for putting this together. I think there's some really great information um, that's coming out of this, and the more accurate information we have to share, I think the better off we're going to be as a society. Dr. Kim, I was taking notes as you spoke because I was learning a great deal from what you said. Um, and you also set up my questions really nicely. So I was asked, what are some of the primary lessons we can learn from the outbreak um, in order to better prepare local and global health systems for similar situations. And I have a number of, of these lessons. One of the first lessons is preparedness matters. And preparedness is, it's a multiplicity of actions. First of all, preparedness means that we have funding for research, we have funding for public health uh, and healthcare structures, and we actually fund prevention. Um, you know, there's been some conversation in the US uh, when we look at our preparedness 
And what we've seen are budget cuts for a number of health organizations across the years. This has happened at the federal level. We've also seen public health agencies at the state level with budgets being cut year by year by year. And of course, one of the problems when we think about public health is primary actions that are taken are prevention. And so how do you show the impact of prevention if something doesn't happen? And when, we, when we're faced with budget austerity, of course, these, these, these programs of, of prevention tend to be cut first. Um, but when we think about preparedness, it's just not just a matter of funding, it's a question of having a plan. And part of that plan is having standard operating procedures, which can easily, easily be adapted for different types of diseases, different public health problems. Um, and with that standard of operation, it's not just how do we communicate, um, as Dr. Kim mentioned, it's what stockpiles do we have, what medicines do we have, what uh, personal protective equipment do we have, how do we operate across the federal, local, and state level, um, how do we communicate, and then how are we flexible? if we are faced with a situation that's a little bit different than what we prepared for. And I'll take the U.S. as an example. The U.S. has a pandemic preparedness plan. Um, the last update to this was 2017. And the pandemic preparedness plan, originally it was developed, um, what, uh, really in response to uh, SARS back in 2003, but it had major revisions um, following the H1N1 um, influenza pandemic of 2009. The, as you learned from Dr. Kim, you know, the coronavirus, it's not influenza, it's, it's, it's different. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we're all grateful for, influenza tends to mutate. Uh, this coronavirus seems to be uh, really quite stable. So how do we take these plans and how do we adapt them for something that we didn't expect to see? Um, preparedness, I think I already mentioned strategic stockpiles. Um, and again, preparedness is having a little bit of experience with diseases. Dr. Kim had mentioned the successful responses in Singapore, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea. Uh, these are countries that had experience with SARS. They had a great deal of experience with um, H1N1. Um, South Korea uh, had experience in 2015 with MERS. What we also see is these countries, there's, there's a little bit of a different so social culture because of the work that has already been done in pandemic response. We see that it's much more of a norm for people to wear face masks, for example, during flu season to not spread the disease. Um, we see that there are much higher levels of um, what we'll call strategic stockpiles. We also see that the community ex is relatively experienced with health communications. There are higher levels of kind of the science and health literacy than we see in a country like, like the United States, which has been very fortunate in many of these um, epidemics and pandemics because we've been geographically isolated. Uh, as a result, we see differences in community expectations and a little bit more facility with shifting communal norms to respond to an emergency situation. Um, over the next, we're already starting to see cases of COVID-19 in a number of African nations. And the conversation in the public health community is that while some of these countries are resource poor and don't have particularly strong health systems, they have a great deal of capability in responding to the threat of an epidemic or pandemic, in part because of their experience with uh, the Ebola epidemic in 2014 to 2016. A number of uh, countries surrounding the DRC are continuing to operate um, with Ebola containment procedures. Um, we also have seen that there was extensive efforts for uh, preparedness, planning, and strengthening of the health system since the 2014-2016 Ebola epidemic. So preparedness matters, and those countries that have a little bit more experience, a little bit more recent experience, I, I, um, as Dr. Kim said, are a little bit better off than the United States. Transparency matters. Um, WHO has said this from day one. We have to communicate information honestly and openly. Um, when the corona, when COVID-19 appeared in China, while there's a little bit of debate around this, by and large, China has been praised for rapidly releasing information about the disease. Um, back in December, they notified the WHO about the disease two days after they had sequenced uh, the genetic structure that was shared internationally. Um, and there's a great deal of information about the cases. Transparency matters because it lets us identify really what's happening with health. Where do we have to focus our attention? Um, transparency matters also in terms of building confidence um, in the communication. Um, and therefore, when we're asked to take action, we understand why we're being asked to do that and we have faith in that. Um, 
under the international health regulations, of course, countries are, are required to report certain things. And again, in this case, China, I would argue, learned from its experience with SARS um, back in 2003 when it didn't report SARS. It would, um, and it received a lot of criticism for a delayed response. Um, I think today there is also a, a editorial in nature that was calling upon world leaders to be transparent with the information. We see the importance of this um, in the United States. There's been I think, unfortunately, um, when COVID-19 appeared in the U.S., we had a bit of a divide in the country, with half the country believing everything the president says and nothing anyone else says, and half the country believing not believing anything the president says and going to other sources. And, you know, the pro and of course, then we had some problems with honest communication. For example, some of the numbers that were initially posted by the CDC, they didn't include cases that were obtained overseas but were present in the United States. And so on the CDC website, we're seeing one set of numbers. And on things like the Johns Hopkins site, we're seeing a higher number of cases in the US that distills trust in public response. Um, we had the same issue come up recently with the UK when uh, Boris Johnson announced that the preliminary strategy for the UK was to not aggressively engage in social distancing and try to build herd immunity. Uh, there was a great deal of public pressure and pressure from epidemiologists and scientists to release the study upon which this decision was made. When that study was released, the UK reversed its direction and said, okay, we're going to take more aggressive measures. So transparency matters, um, expertise matters. Um, and again, when we look at the global response, WHO has a great deal of experience with pandemic, with pandemic preparedness, pandemic response. Um, a number of nation states do as well. Epidemiologists and public health workers also have a great deal of knowledge about this. The question is, how do we communicate kind of this evidence-based knowledge with, with policymakers, and how do we not let politics get in the way? Importantly, coordination matters. And you know, when we look at the response plan in the US, we have the federal structure, we have the state structure, and we have the local structure. The vast majority of preparedness, be it pandemic preparedness or uh, disaster preparedness, is based on the idea that the national response is basically to provide technical guidance, to provide funding, and to really provide that surge in resources. And then states and local actors are going to make the decisions based on local assessment of needs and best and kind of the best practices there. The problem, of course, what we've seen in the United States is we've had a little bit of trouble with this coordination. And as Dr. Kim mentioned, it really started with the availability of the testing kits. Um, and so when we think of some of the primary lessons we're going to get out of this, it's going to be better, better coordination um, across these different sectors. But it's not just a question of national, federal, and state level. We also have to think about cross-sector coordination. And I work in social determinants of health. And so we believe that, yeah, the, the pathogen is certainly one thing we have to be concerned with. But we start to see different fault lines, if you will, of vulnerability based on things like socioeconomic factors, uh, based on things like access to healthcare, based on things like economic supports. And that's certainly come up in the COVID-19 response. One of the things that we've seen in the US are these really important questions about if we have a test available, who pays for it? Um, we've heard a lot in the news that South Korea has done an amazing job with testing. Singapore's done a great job with testing. China was great with testing. What we've heard less about is that in all of those cases, the tests were free. So if the test isn't free, we have disincentive. Now the US government just took steps to make testing free, but then we have the question of treatment. And if we, if we, are if we do test positive for COVID-19 and we have to go into isolation, we have to go into quarantine, if we have to seek medical care, how do we pay for that? And that's one of the challenges that we're facing in the US right now is, is really how do we pay for that and how do we pay for those who don't have insurance? Um, these are, again, these fault lines of vulnerability. Economics matter. Um, we're seeing that right now. We're, we have, a, I mean, we, we have a public health response on a scale that we haven't seen in at least a century. And what we're seeing with social distancing practices, what we're seeing with people that are self-isolating, what we're seeing with people that are working at home, and what we're seeing with some of the, the business closures, is that we are concerned about what's happening with people's purse, with people's pocketbook. And we have to have some sort of economic support in place, um, not just for the household level, um, but for the national level and the global level as well. Um, along with that coordination, 
I think it's important to remember that infectious diseases don't respect boundaries. Um, infectious disease control is a transnational issue, and we need to have coordination across nation states, but sh yeah. actually, I'll leave it at that. Um, kind of one of our other important lessons is education does matter. Um, one, we have to get information out there to the public, honest information, about what is the disease, what can it do, um, and what actions can you take? This is particularly challenging when we have a novel virus because a lot of times we just don't know. We have some information, we can say we think this may happen, but um, what we see in risk communication is it's okay to say you don't know. People can hear that message. They can't hear lies. Um, so again, treat us like adults. Um, Another thing that we're seeing, um, and we're just starting to see more information come in on some of these social determinants of the outcomes of the COVID virus, uh, science literacy seems to matter. We've, we've, we've seen in the media, um, Dr. Kim has alluded to this, but we've seen very, we, we've seen levels of success with managing COVID-19 in South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Uh, these are all places that have very high levels of science literacy. And so the communication with the public about the disease and the pathology of disease has been um, really quite successful. Um, another thing, I think another important lesson from this is responses have to have multiple stages and they need to be flexible. Um, they should be evidence-based. If we look at the response from China, China had a three-stage strategy, really focusing initially on containment. But then when, we, when China saw the widespread widespread community, pardon me, uh, community spread. It switched to a different strategy. Um, there was kind of this very large quarantine and a lot of elements that went into that. And then kind of this third stage was starting to loosen the restrictions and starting to build solidarity and rebuild the economy. Um, if we look at the response to South Korea, South Korea's response seems to have gone through, you know, five different stages and it's been able to adapt some of the lessons that it's learned with previous epidemics. Um, most importantly, uh, and Dr. Kim, again, I appreciate that he said this, what we've learned is we really have to protect the most vulnerable. Um, I think it was Paul Farmer who said that in epidemics, we tend to see the, the fault lines of society, um, and it tends, to be, it tends to be the poor, both the economically poor and those who don't have power that suffer the most. Um, and what we see, with this is, I think we're all very aware, we have to protect our healthcare workers. Um, they have a very high chance of getting sick, um, which, is, which is unfortunate. One thing that I will comment on, um, Journal of American Medical Association published a study, very small study, but it did show while uh, healthcare workers face a higher chance of getting sick, they seem to have a much lower case fatality rate than we've seen with some other diseases. Um, that's good news. Um, again, Dr. Kim mentioned those who are elderly and those with comorbidities are at risk, but we don't talk about other risk factors. And one of the things that was interesting with China, um, so one study that said anywhere from 60 to 67% uh, of the population smokes. And smoking was a risk factor, of course, for respiratory illness, and it's believed to have been a risk factor for what we're seeing with COVID-19. In the initial cases that we saw out of China, there seemed to be a slightly higher number of men than women who were getting sick. Um, there's some interesting work that's being done on the, epi on the genetic epidemiology. Um, but one of the questions is, is it possibly because men smoke more? So if we think about smoking as a risk, that certainly gives a, a different way to think about who might be at risk for COVID-19 in the United States. Um, and certainly we also have to think about the poor in our country because these are the folks that don't necessarily have access to healthcare. Um, and there are disincentives for taking appropriate action to prevent spread in the community. Um, we've also, in Denver, we've seen a conversation around the homeless. I cannot think of a group other than medical workers that is, more, that is actually more vulnerable to what COVID-19 can possibly do. Not only do we, not, do we have a group of people that don't have shelters, no access to healthcare, and if you're asked to self-isolate for 14 days, where do you go? Um, the shelters aren't while they're trying to be prepared for this right now, they're not. Um, so I think those are some of the big lessons I hope we learn from this. Um, I also had a question, how can countries show solidarity with one another in the context of COVID-19? And I had to think about this and I was really thinking, 
that perhaps one of the when I think about COVID-19 and what we're seeing globally, the best, the closest comparison I can come up with is that of World War II. And I want to be clear, it's not because of the number of casualties that we expect to see, because our social fabric is changing and it's every day we wake up and it's not just our, our local community that's different, but the world has really changed because of the policies that are being put in place, because of how we're learning new ways of interacting with each other. And our social fabric is going to remain changed for quite some time. Um, and so I'm trying to, and if we, when I think about that, I think, okay, well, then how do we show solidarity with that, with the understanding that A, we are all in this together, B, life is changing for everyone. Um, and it's been changing in some predictable ways, it's been changing in some unpredictable ways. First and foremost, don't blame the victim. Um, we've seen, and we continue to see, unfortunately, xenophobia. We see victim blaming. We seem to see that with every infectious disease that comes up. We just need to stop. Um, two, one of the things that we're seeing, I think, at every level is people sharing information. Um, we're sharing information about the disease. Um, and in terms of, of solidarity, what we've seen is the global community not just talking about how do we detect, how do we contain, how do we control and treat. We also see a great deal of cooperation in terms of research and treatment. Um, I mentioned previously, China, China had shared the genetic sequence really quickly. Um, we see many uh, research institutes that you know, are typically rivals in institutes saying, we are openly publicizing our data. We are sharing information on COVID-19. It is not a question of who, comes to, who gets to publish first. It's a question of let's get this information out there and cooperate. Um, we see this, um, we've seen this in terms of characterizing the pathogen and uh, impact. Dr. Kim talked a little bit about the vaccination. Um, and I think that right now we have two, a big push in the US and a big push in China uh, in terms of developing the vaccination. It's kind of amazing when you think about, we've had about 60 days and we're already going into a trial for a vaccine with technology that we haven't, that we haven't used for vaccines before. Um, we also see some really good coordination with testing treatment options um, for COVID-19. Uh, yesterday, WHO announced the Solidarity Trial, uh, which is basically trying to bring countries together to test drugs to treat COVID-19. So far, 10 countries are involved in this, and I suspect we're going to see other countries sign up for that. I think that that's, that's a great way to show solidarity. We're doing these trials together. Um, there's been a lot of sharing of best practices um, across different nations, and we see this um, in terms of the packages of responses that have been implemented, in terms of the rapid studies that have been done, and how that, those have been both uh, published and pushed out to the media. In terms of solidarity, I will harp on this. Um, we have to protect the most vulnerable. And to do that, we all have to make changes in the way we live. Um, some of the work some of the early work on COVID-19 was basically saying about 80% of the population is going to have relatively minor symptoms, 20% there's going to be greater severity. So this is how I think about it. We think about that 80%, that's five out of six people. And five out of six people are going to experience mild symptoms. So here's one story. They've experienced mild symptoms. They say, okay, this is no big deal. I didn't get really sick. I didn't have to go to the hospital. Why do I have to change my behavior? And this is where we have to look at this other side of the story. The other side of the story is one out of six people are going to require critical care. Um, we've seen stories in the paper, we've heard from our friends, we've heard from you know, the doctors, the nurses, the health technicians that are on the front line, that in China, people were dying because they couldn't get into the hospital. People were dying at home. There are people that were dying in the hospital because of critical shortages of, of equipment. Um, we see sim similar stories coming out of Italy. We see similar stories coming out of Spain. We don't want our work medical workers to be in a position of having to choose between who receives critical care. And so that's the story that I think is really powerful. But there's still another story, and that's thinking about those who already need critical care but aren't sick with COVID-19. Um, I was reading a number of statistics uh, and it was saying that in the US, uh, the ICUs and hospitals typically run between 60 to 80% capacity. That's prior to COVID-19. So when we go back to this, how do we show solidarity? 
it's thinking of these stories and understanding that many of us who aren't infected with COVID-19 or many of us have mild symptoms, we're taking, we're taking action not just for ourselves, but we're taking action for, for those other folks that are really in fairly dire circumstances. And our actions can make a difference. Um, some other things that we're seeing, I think in terms of solidarity, there are some incredibly creative responses to what's happening out there. Um, we're seeing this in anything from kind of state level where we have states saying, okay, we're closing our schools, but we're gonna to continue to pay our bus drivers. We're going to continue to pay the folks that would typically be preparing food for students. Um, and we're going to have them deliver home meals so that we're maintaining food security during this. Um, we're seeing it, I have to share this. I, I was at a local grocery store yesterday and they had a sign that said, um, during this period, we are going to open the store. The first hour is only for people who are over age 60. And I think that's so wonderful because they're giving them a safe space to shop. Um, and let's see. Um, and I think kind of the final thing where we're seeing a great deal of solidarity, while countries have been somewhat discoordinated in their response to the pandemic, there seems to be a great deal of cohesion in the global response to uh, the economic crisis. And here we're stepping outside of public health and we're looking at what can we do economically, kind of with these macroeconomic responses. And the global community has a lot of experience like this and they learned a lot of lessons from 2008, 2009. Um, there are also a lot of lessons that were learned during World War II. And we see that we have both um, monetary policy responses and fiscal policy responses, which I think are incredibly important. Um, the final question I was asked to address is uh, talking about uh, US airlines asking for 50 billion in federal assistance. Um, what kind of impact do I see this having on travel in the coming years? And I actually wanna take that question back a little bit um, because it's not just the airlines. I wanna talk a little bit about tourism. Uh, and tourism, if we look at the global economy, um, numbers from UNWTO, numbers from uh, WTTO, basically say tourism accounts for about 10% of the global GDP. That's huge. Global tourism accounts for one in 10 jobs globally. That's huge. Uh, the airline industry and the hotel industry, I think are two of the most visible actors, um, but they're not the only actors. And when we look at this idea of tourism, there are small companies that are involved in tourism and there are an awful lot of service workers that are involved in tourism. And so when we see the plane stopping, when we see travel stopping, when we see the hotels shutting down, we should be concerned not just for those industries, but for the individuals in the industries and for these small scale operators whose lifeline is tied to tourism. Um, we have seen um, with the US, uh, the US government has uh, issued a fairly substantial package of aid. 50 billion of that is targeted for the airline industry and that's great. It was also really good to see that in that package, uh, there was mention of the smaller businesses. Um, and we also see now this conversation of support to individuals. Any response, I, I, would, I would argue, uh, has to include both these large industries, but then the small scale operators. And happily, that's what we're seeing. Um, just one final note, when we think about kind of the economic support and the tools that we have available for that, um, with fiscal policy, we need, to, we need to protect the people, the firms, and the industry. We're seeing targeted temporary cash flows, um, and I think that that's really important. We saw this in China, we saw this in South Korea. We've seen this in the countries that experienced the first wave of COVID, and now we're starting to see European nations as well as the US issue packages um, of this temporary cash flow relief. Um, we're also, what we learned in the first wave, uh, temporary cash transfers to the most vulnerable are important. And again, we're starting to see Europe and the US, um, Canada, start to address these kind of ca these uh, cash transfers. Um, and we're also seeing different types of tax relief. That's still being debated in the US what's going to happen there, but it's tax relief for industry, it's tax relief for small businesses. Um, so there's a lot that can be done economically to try to stabilize what's happening at the household level as well as at the international level. Um, one final thing, um, how to help, and Dr. Kim, I think you had some really, really great recommendations. Um, I also want to mention uh, 
WHO um, has a WHO Solidarity Fund. It's the first time that WHO has basically set up a fund for individual corporations uh, and individuals to give money to basically target relief for the COVID-19. Um, shout out for those of you who are in Colorado. Governor Polis established the HelpColoradoNow.org. I will say that again, HelpColoradoNow.org. Um, this has two components. It has an option to sign up to volunteer, and it also has an option to give money to target relief efforts in the Colorado community. I think what's really great about this, um, not only is it providing financial relief, but it's setting up kind of a command and control structure for coordination of volunteers to be deployed as necessary throughout our community. Um, and of course, I asked my students what their recommendations are. A uh, couple of things, just think about how you can help your neighbor. Um, one student said, you know what? We have neighbors that can't go shopping because they're in a highly vulnerable group, so we're gonna go shopping for them. Um, be prepared to help uh, and just kind of think creatively about how you can reach out to people in your own neighborhood um, and help them with any needs they may have. Thank you. I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Johnson. Um, we have uh, a number of uh, questions lined up and I think, uh, William, you're going to take that over and pose the questions for us. Sure. Um, yeah, so a few have, there's quite a few questions that have been coming in. Um, Dr. Kim, maybe actually you can um, first address the question regarding blood type and if that has any effect on um, vulnerability. Sure. Um, I just saw that as well, that there was some evidence that uh, the patients with type A versus uh, type O uh, were afflicted with more severe disease from COVID-19 infections. Um, I think there's definitely some truth to that. Uh, there is ongoing research about blood type and diseases in general. Uh, there had already been evidence uh, with blood types A and B being a little bit more susceptible to heart disease in polluted uh, countries uh, as opposed to blood type O. So I think that's definitely uh, something that's, there's definitely some evidence behind, but uh, I'm not sure that how that plays out in how we manage patients in general. I think uh, blood type, certainly you should be aware of your blood type. And maybe if you have blood type A, you, you should be aware that maybe you might be afflicted with a little bit more of a severe form. But again, uh, it, it won't change how we approach patients or how we manage patients. Um, there was a story um, here in the chat uh, in regards to uh, the diagnostic testing and how long it takes for um, a test to come back positive or negative, uh, the current wait time being about five days. Um, so there's clearly an impact there on the accuracy of the numbers that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of uh, new infections. Um, the question is, uh, what do you think the accurate numbers are right now um, in, in the United States? I think uh, I saw the question via text and I think 10 times of what we see uh, as far as numbers now is, is probably accurate. Uh, we will see a, a huge spike in the new number of new cases in the next two weeks, mainly because of increased testing and really our loosening of, uh, of testing criteria. Uh, you know, the turnaround time of five days is really not acceptable. And institution-based um, testing has been started in, within the last uh, two weeks. Uh, for example, here at Hopkins, we, uh, we used to have to send out all our, our labs to the CDC, and it, it took at minimum 48 hours to get results back. Uh, but now I think other institutions and, and our institution is able to do testing uh, on site. And so the turnaround time is less than 24 hours. But it's not going to be available at every institution. Uh, and so that certainly does hamper our identification of, of uh, individuals, especially those with more milder uh, symptoms that could still be transmitting the disease. And so I think the number uh, of actual cases in the United States is, is probably 10 times more of, than what we, what we know. Uh, the testing will also, of course, impact the mortality rates, as I had mentioned uh, Italy had a mortality rate of 7%, and again, that 
is attributed to some of the uh, comorbidities in older population in Italy. But South Korea's mortality is 0.7%, and that's also in part because they've done such extensive testing with milder cases and even young patients. Uh, and so I think uh, the truth is probably uh, in between 1% to 2%. Um, but we won't really know until we have a better handle on how many people are actually affected. Thank you. Um, so uh, Tanner writes uh, that there are many conflicting reports on the time it takes to contract COVID-19 after being exposed. Um, do we have a more accurate estimate now? Um, and an, a, perhaps a follow-up question is, um, how long uh, should we remain in quarantine uh, before we are no longer contagious if we do have um, the virus? So, as, so exact figures on, and timing of when you get uh, when you get the virus, when you show symptoms, how long you are uh, contagious. These are pretty much unknown. Um, I could tell you from what we're seeing in the patient population, uh, it takes anywhere from two to 14 days to show symptoms if you're going to show symptoms, and really the average time is around five to six days. Now, how long will you be contagious for, again, is unknown because we haven't had the uh, advanced degree of testing that, uh, that we should have in place. Um, but in the hospital, uh, after about two weeks, after there is complete amelioration of symptoms, uh, many of our patients are testing negative, and that's when uh, we are able to release them uh, from the hospital. Um, I have a question perhaps for uh, both of you, actually, Professor Johnson and Professor, or Dr. Kim, sorry. Um, it's, a, it's a very overarching question um, from uh, Barry Berman. Uh, this will happen again. What will we learn so we are better prepared? Um, but so from the perspective, global health, uh, from the perspective of uh, an individual hospital, um, or the, per, the um, perspective of just uh, an ordinary citizen. Um, what do we need to learn here <laughs> so that we're better prepared? So um, I am very optimistic that we will be better prepared next time. I, um, we, are we are learning we have to have a plan in place. We are learning we have to put money into public health and research. I suspect in this country, it's going to fuel a longer conversation about healthcare um, and a serious conversation about healthcare um, and access, basically access to healthcare for all. We are most likely, optimistic again, um, going to recognize that the international structures and protocols that we had in place actually helped us with this, and we therefore continue to need to support them. Um, I'm going to pause there, and Dr. Kim, I'll let you take it away. I was just um, reading the question about why Germany's uh, mortality rate is so low. I think um, I think the spike in, in number of new tests is related to testing. And I think uh, as we broadened our uh, testing, uh, or Germany had broadened their testing and, and loosened their criteria, uh, you know, I think the, the spike in new cases is related to that. Uh, the reason their mortality is so low is probably, uh, you know, there may be many factors that I'm not aware of, but I suspect that their population is a bit younger, certainly than, you, than Italy and, and some of the other countries and whether they're actually healthier in general or have better access to healthcare, um, that I'm not sure of, but uh, that I suspect that might be the case. Um, I, I will actually address that. Um, the, it's interesting because both Germany and Italy do have relatively equitable access to healthcare for their population, so that's a little bit different than the US where it's very fragmented. Um, the Italian healthcare system has been criticized for a number of years, in part because it's been underfunded, um, and in part because of the, the financial structures. So it, it hasn't been considered one of the more advanced um, healthcare systems. Again, it, it's already fairly advanced compared to other countries. Um, 
the German healthcare system is actually considered relatively well financed and a fairly modern system. My understanding of the, the German health insurance is that there is guaranteed access to healthcare for everyone. That certainly comes into play and that's something that we saw in Korea. There was 100% access to healthcare and there are no charges attached to both detect to testing and treatment in South Korea. We're seeing something similar in Singapore. So these healthcare, the access to healthcare as well as the healthcare structure itself, I, I believe come into play when we're looking at the case fatality rates. Um, I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the hour. Um, if I can ask just one more question, um, in terms of social media, obviously social media has had a huge influence on the spread of information and misinformation um, when it comes to COVID-19. Um, is there any advice that you can provide um, in terms of how we should be looking at everything that we're, we're reading, um, especially before communicating it to uh, not only our peers, but um, in many cases, our staffs, um, our, our colleagues, um, to make sure that we're not being more harmful than helpful? So one, I think it is incumbent upon us all to check sources. If somebody posted it on social media, where did they get the information from? And is it from a source that actually engages in fact checking? Um, two, I think it is all of our responsibility to correct bad information. Um, ha again, have to give a shout out to my students. Um, I was teaching a course this quarter and I offered the students a bounty of kind of extra credit points for finding misinformation on social media and providing correct information. We all have the power to do that. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you everybody for um, your time. Thank you, Professor Johnson and Dr. Kim uh, for your time and your expertise. Um, I found this personally very, very enlightening um, and very helpful. Um, and I'm sure many of uh, our guests have as well. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paul, for hosting. Um, and again, we will be, we have recorded the session and we'll be making it available to um, everyone. So. If uh, you have colleagues who wanted to join but weren't able to, uh, you can pass that along. We'll be um, sending this out um, via our newsletter, and I believe World Denver will be doing the same. Um, so thank you so much, and um, have a great rest of your week. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.